Um, so let, Ed, let me just have a ahead, couple Mike. of concluding uh, remarks. As LADWP moves forward with battery storage, solar implementation, we expect to have 600 megawatts on by the end of the summer. We're going to be 25 percent renewable uh, this year. These are all important movements towards a world where we can get beyond natural gas, but it will take us some time to get there. And what I want to also leave you with is we are also looking at backup fuel. We're working with South Coast AQMD on a variant so that we can maybe get some backup fuel. So in the short term, this will also help increase the reliability of the electric supply this summer. And when I say this summer, this is not two months from now. Literally this summer for the utility industry could be this weekend. So we are in that situation with unexpected loads and some very, very high peaks. So it could happen at any time from now all the way through October. And so with that, I'll turn this back to uh, Ed Randolph. Thank you, Michael. Um, um, you, you quite, uh, Chairman, you quite artfully took us off of our um, presentation a little bit. And I, I do want to add to a little bit of the question you asked, which I, I think boils down to can the system operate without Aliso Canyon? Um, and I think the answer is, in the long term, sure. Um, but it's going to take a series of infrastructure investments um, in changing in how the system operates, both maybe different pipeline configurations, different storage configurations, or big investments to reduce gas demand overall. Um, you know, as, as it's been noted, this, this study here is not about that. It's about getting through this summer, about um, – playing the cards we were dealt for this summer, there is a plan, um, as ordered by Senator Pavley's bill, for us to take that long-term assessment. It very specifically requires the PUC to be the lead working with the other agencies uh, to do that long-term assessment. And we look forward to um, getting started on that um, in the very near future. Um, going back to the actual um, report in this summer, the last set of mitigation measures, and a lot of these will have permanent impact, um, are reducing actual electric and gas um, load. Um, you know, top of that list is uh, SoCal Gas has been ordered to spend $11 million on marketing and outreach um, um, on load reduction. Part of that is continuing a program um, that's been fairly successful over the year called Flex Alert. Um, and the rest of that will be spent on um, uh, gas reduction messaging. Um, going down the list quickly from there, um, we've expanded spending and targeted that to uh, the LA region for low income, both gas and electric uh, conservation measures. Um, these have been some successful programs over time that we think putting more money and more boots on the ground in those areas in LA uh, will lead to significant savings um, this summer there. Um, expanding demand response programs. Um, you know, these include things like AC cycling, where customers are paid to um, um, allow their air conditioners to be turned off for an hour or two hours at a time on peak days. Um, um, expanding newer programs such as putting in uh, smart thermostats. So thermostats like the Nest thermostat that instead of turning the um, AC off entirely, you may be turning it up or down a couple degrees depending on if it's a hot or a cold day. Um, and expanding some programs or continuing some programs um, uh, for larger industrial customers. Um, um, also, uh, reprioritizing um, uh, um, efforts on some energy efficiency programs that are already underway for large customers. Uh, these are largely commercial customers. Um, we're working with the utilities to identify um, uh, specific measures that have already been approved that typically take um, nine months to a year from the beginning of outreach to the customers to getting them online to figure out how to streamline those programs. Um, that'll include putting more boots on the ground to help uh, do the initial analysis that's required um, to, um, you know, even identifying permitting issues and reaching out to the local governments uh, by using the governor's office, uh, LA mayor's office, and OPR to accelerate permitting. Um, just last Friday, we um, uh, approved a measure to uh, reprioritize funding for um, solar thermal rooftop in the L.A. basin. But you're talking about electrical. Well, where we're, I'm, I'd like to focus a little more on, on gas. gas. Well, so this next one is gas. Um, so most of the summer is focused on electric since 
the demand, what is what will cause the issues in the summer is peak electric demand. So we're trying to lower that peak electric demand. But what what is the relationship to gas? Well, the relationship to gas is on those when there's peak electric demand, they've got to run the gas plant. Um, so if we eliminate the need to run the gas plant, then the gas demand goes away. Okay. Um, but you also have a lot of people using gas in their homes. In the summertime, very it's consistently, very consistently. But in the summertime, it's a very small percentage of the total demand. Okay. Um, and so, you know, we want to focus on the the big places, which is actually on the electric. As we get into the winter assessment, that'll flip. Heating. Yeah, and okay. it'll be heating, um, water heating, and okay. cooking are the big demands in the winter time. The next one that I was just on is the one that it's actually probably won't help much this summer, but we're getting rolling because we know it'll help next summer, which is the rooftop solar thermal. So this is um, uh, heating water on the rooftop in its simplest form, and that replaces the need for the gas water heater. Um, these programs have been around for a little while. They've been largely unsuccessful, um, in large part because the price of natural gas is so low um, that it makes it really hard, even if you're uh, paying 50, 60 percent of the installed cost of the system, um, it still doesn't pencil out for most homeowners, uh, given the, the, the cost of, of natural gas. We're moving the rebates up um, for systems that can be installed in the L.A. Basin by um, December 31st of this year. So hopefully that gives a big kicker to that industry to get out there and get more installed. Um, and then another that I think will be very critical on the electric side is um, accelerating getting uh, battery storage installed in the L.A. Basin. Um, this is another thing that would reduce um, that need for the fossil fuel plant to fire up um, as we hit um, peak moments as solar is coming offline um, or if other issues are going on the system. Um, we, on Friday, um, sent a letter out to SoCal Edison um, that will allow them to um, start signing contracts with uh, storage providers that actually already had some contracts um, that were approved by the commission or are now tied up in court. Um, this will allow it to move forward while it's tied up in court. Um, and I think in the next few days, we'll probably see some uh, more actions from the commission um, that will authorize Edison to do some additional procurement on the storage front. Um, and with that, I think handing it back over to Rob. Do you have the next slide? Katie. Or Katie. Yeah. So, Senators, we thought we'd take a few minutes. We thought we'd take a few minutes and walk through some of the um, comments that we got back on the action plan. Um, after the workshop that was held on April 8th, we asked people to submit comments by April 22nd. We've reviewed those comments and we'll share a few highlights with okay. you because there are some, um, it'll help, I think, address some questions. One of the comments that came back was, well, SoCal Gas has got 5.7 BCF per day of capacity. If you take the pipeline capacity and you add the storage, why didn't you use all of it? Well, the reason we didn't use all of it is because what we've observed in, real, in the real world is that customers don't use it, all of that capacity necessarily. Customers schedule their own gas. They don't have to, as I explained earlier, they don't have to schedule as much gas as they burn. If they don't do that and we end up with a mismatch, we could make that up if we had Aliso Canyon. We can't make it up without Aliso Canyon. So we ended up creating a mitigation measure, which was to tighten the balancing rules to address that problem. Another comment was, mm -hmm. well, states like Arizona and Nevada don't have any storage. Uh, how do they solve this problem? Um, they solve it in a very kind of complicated, unsatisfactory way. Uh, and if any of them um, could have store underground gas storage, they would. Arizona has tried several times. There have been at least two, if not three, projects that I'm familiar with over the last 25 years to develop underground gas storage, and they've all been unsuccessful for one reason or another. One of the fields um, actually said at the end of the runway at Luke Air Force Base, and the Air Force opposed it. Uh, um, so they use... Um, some of the line pack in the interstate pipelines that serve them. Those tend to be lar long, long line, straight line kinds of pipes as opposed to the grid system that we have, particularly when we get inside the LA Basin. So it's a little bit easier for them to provide line pack. Uh, it's a little bit easier also for them to sort of loop the system um, in certain locations uh, and use that looping segment uh, to provide some line pack. El Paso Natural Gas has a special tariff 
uh, under which they charge much higher rates to provide that service, so it's not cheap to get it. Uh, and there are a lot of customers, uh, particularly utility generators, uh, around Phoenix uh, and Las Vegas that would love to have underground gas storage. I've heard of another project, uh, I think that UAMP, the Utah um, Association of Municipal Power, I'm probably um, goofing up that acronym, um, has been looking at, at a project that's up near Intermountain Power in Utah, which is located along the Kern River gas transmission line uh, to get those folks some storage. Um, El Paso Natural Gas does actually have a storage field attached to its system. Uh, it's called the Washington Ranch Facility, uh, located in uh, eastern New Mexico. Um, another issue or, or um, comment that we got back is um, it's not, it, it's, it shouldn't really matter that um, uh, gas uh, gets consumed before it gets to California. Um, and if, in effect, what we've seen on cold days, we saw this in the polar vortex in February of 2014, that polar vortex storm that was so cold. We also saw it in February 2011 when there was extreme cold um, throughout Texas, including in West Texas, where the wellheads froze and the gas gathering pipelines froze. That sucks up supply that otherwise could come to California. You also, in those conditions, see higher demand. Uh, Eastern New Mexico, particularly Santa Fe, as I recall, actually had natural gas curtailments. The governor of New Mexico called a gas emergency, called out the National Guard to help restore service. We don't want to have to do that. So it's really important to us to recognize that there are going to be days with conditions so cold to our east where more natural gas demand occurs, they use the gas that otherwise might be available to come to California, and or prices drive gas to to eastern markets where it might be colder and so price goes up. So for those reasons, we can't count on our pipe being full. Another issue that came up is that um, the flowing supply isn't really limited to 3.875, but uh, you've got 6.7 BCF of capacity coming to California. Why didn't we use all 6.7 BCF capacity that comes to California? The issue there is that 6.7 may come to California to SoCal Gas's system, but on the SoCal Gas side of the meter, we only have takeaway capacity for 3.875. We have an intentional mismatch, and it is intentional, set by policy at the PUC um, many, many years ago. We all agreed that it was important for California to be able to play off one pipeline against another and one gas producer against another. And so we explicitly have a mismatch into the utility systems versus the capacity that comes to us versus the gas we can take away. Um, and our intention was that that was a good thing. Um, we have also been asked why we didn't consider Playa del Rey in our hydraulic simulations. Um, the phrase that we used was that we held Playa del Rey in the simulations, we held Playa del Rey in reserve. And somehow that got um, transmogrified or translated, if you will, uh, into that we didn't use it. Well, we did use it. What we did is we started the simulation and we didn't use it initially to meet forecast demand, but when we got actual demand, saw that it was different than what the supply that we had coming in, we used that gas supply from Playa Del Rey to help meet the difference. So we went back last week and double checked to confirm so that we could say today um, that yes, not only was Playa Del Rey used, but it turns out that the mismatches in supply were large enough on two of our four days that Playa del Rey was in fact used in hour one and was used all 24 hours of, of the day. Um, the other last issue is um, storage the storage field. And I think there's some confusion about um, the relationship between inventory and withdrawal capability. Um, so, when we talk about the firm capacity to withdraw from a gas storage field, that's normally discussed with the field full. Um, and we would talk about our maximum ability to pull gas from the storage field. But as the inventory depletes over the course of the withdrawal season, we're pulling gas out over the, the winter, when there's less gas in the field, that reduces sort of the push 
for the gas to come out of the field. And so we actually get less out as we go through, through, the, through the season. So over time, as you withdraw gas from the field, we can't get that maximum withdrawal each and every day. It actually reduces drops over the course of the season. At the end of the season, you won't get nearly as much as you could on the first day of the winter. And with that, I'm going to go back to, we're going to go back to Rob. So just a quick wrap, wrap up. As you heard, the Aliso storage facility has been relied upon uh, in when the system was designed in, in the Southern California region. Uh, and it has been used to provide reliability, not only in the summer, but in the winter. And it plays a key for, role in reliability for, to support the electrical generation. A uh, couple of qualifiers. Um, while it is important to provide reliability, uh, as you've heard, a number of steps are being taken to mitigate and work without it or in a, rely on it to a lesser degree during the summer. The system has never been operated this way. There's never been an attempt to reduce demand and also um, do a near perfect match of anticipation of gas supply and gas consumption. We still have 15 billion feet left in Aliso. However, there will be no additional injections until Dogger determines that it's a safe uh, environment. To and those are, currently being, those are currently being drawn out no, the 15 bill, demand. The 15 billion are held in reserve just in case. And the CPUC will... It's not being used to balance? No. It will only be used on the most extreme days. Okay. It's the Unfortunate we're... But it can be used. So it can be used. It's there. It can be used. It's okay. And fortunately, we have a full 15 billion, as, as we understand it, a full 15 billion available to us because we had a warm uh, winter, so we didn't have to rely on it to get us through the last aspect, mm -hmm. you know, to get, get through winter. So we have that. Um, however, that 15 billion until, if and until... Um, Aliso could be, uh, the, the stores in, in uh, Aliso could be replenished. That $15 billion is is um, both for summer and, and maybe a hedge for winter so as well. So Aliso will be there to help through the summer, just to be yes, certain. It's to be clear, still to in terms of a source of gas to help us for the rest of the year. Yeah, yes. Should it be needed? Yes. Uh, okay. For the $15 billion cubic feet, absolutely, to help get out of a, out of a pinch. Okay. Um, Senator, did you have questions? a couple of questions before the next panel, so whenever... Before the next panel, we can do that now, and then we'll go to Senator Hill. One question, if I could, of... Uh, and um, just goes back, Mr. Webster, you Well, well let's, okay. let's have her. She's been waiting okay, for this. So let's... We'll have her, and then we'll go. And uh, I appreciate the presentation, because several of my questions were answered during mm -hmm. that, and so I won't reiterate them. Um, but thank you, Chair Waitzel, for clarifying about the $15 billion cubic feet. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about pipelines. And I, I know there was some discussion by Cal ISO and changing tariff changes and everything. But um, are we maximizing the ability and capacity of pipelines bringing in natural gas for, for use uh, throughout the throughout the system or directly into utility plants or other kinds of options there? I'm concerned about, um, and I think someone made a presentation that generally the demand is for the winter time, and you do all the maintenance on pipelines in the summertime. I'm concerned about deferred maintenance going on during the summer when we're dealing with potential heat episodes that could cause a spike. Um, and I want to make sure that SoCal Gas and others are very much... Um, on, on top of this, that this would not be the year to be doing a lot of deferred maintenance on pipelines that we traditionally. So obviously, March, April, and May would have been a nice time for deferred maintenance. And I'm hoping to hear from someone that it's not going to be during the summertime when we're um, trying uh, very hard to uh, um, it's, uh, ramp up demand response and other kinds of things that um, consumers can be doing, but we're not also making it more challenging in of itself. So can anyone talk about pipeline capacity and deferred maintenance of pipeline well, and I mean, the timing thereof? I, mean, I, I can address, and then we should probably leave it to the utility to get into more specific details on deferred maintenance. One of the mitigation measures 
um, was to defer maintenance and how we're addressing that um, since um, it does create a difficult choice. If you defer maintenance that's needed for safety reasons, you potentially are creating another safety problem down uh, the road. Um, there are a number of maintenance um, programs under what's called PSAP um, that um, uh, uh, SoCal Gas was authorized or ordered to do um, in prior commission decisions that were lined up for this year. Um, in, instead of letting them make the decision individually on which projects they would defer um, or leaving it to PUC staff to make that decision, um, that right now is part of a, a quickly moving uh, decision-making process at the commission where the utilities have filed what projects they propose to delay maintenance on, and that's subject to public comment right now. Well, um, clock, clock is ticking. Yes. Um, on almost a May, you know, April, May, and June would have been ideal, and so I'm very concerned. Yeah, I'll, I'll let them talk about what work they're doing now. Um, I know that proceeding, just like almost every other proceeding we have looking at this summer, um, is is um, scheduled to have a decision by the June 6th hearing that we have, understanding that those decisions need to be in place uh, before we get into the traditional summer season. And so-called gas may have a response that they're, I mean, I would assume on the natural they realized that they should have expedited any kind of maintenance or deferred maintenance so that we don't create problems. So, so, so maybe I can, I can add some, uh, some information to this. Uh, we're currently going through maintenance now on a pipeline for our compliance obligations that we have both on with the PUC and with the Department of Transportation and those rules. So, We've scheduled that, and we've scheduled a lot during this period of time because of the shoulder months. Likewise, we schedule that later in the year when it's a shoulder month, and we try to avoid the peak periods. We also coordinate it with our outages for maintenance at our storage fields. So we're going through that process, and we're working through the list to make sure that we do not defer items that are safety-related, uh, and we also try to work within the, the confines of the system and the demand on the system that could occur. I would, I would say that uh, from the Cal ISO's perspective, uh, we've already seen the increased amount of coordination on this effort. Uh, we have uh, bi-leakly calls to discuss upcoming outage events, and we discuss it at a level of detail uh, down to um, if they take that outage, uh, can they get back off that outage if we see a potential heat wave coming through that overlays. So we. We're, we're more aware of it. Um, we are taking into consideration those outages and, and to the extent possible, we're not, we're, we're trying to minimize coincident transmission, elect transmission outages that would overlay on top of those that could exacerbate the issue. Thank you. Thank you for the coordination. Um, two more questions if I, I may. Um, what was not brought up and it, uh, several people asked me about it is the whether the Honor Rancho can provide natural gas into the LA, the LA loop, um, which heard it was uh, not operational or it was. It's not that far away. There seems to be conflicting reports in whatever analysis you're reading on the role of the you know, Honor Rancho. Senator, um, the hydraulic analysis that we right. applied, in fact, did use Honor Rancho completely and fully into the LA loop so that it can be used this summer for to help alleviate some of the reliability concerns. Well, it's it's it it doesn't actually substitute on a detailed basis uh, you know in the uh, you know 3 o'clock in the afternoon and I'm making up that uh, that hour that, that, as an example. Um, it's a little bit far, farther away. It's on the high pressure system, not on the low pressure system. But we used all of the gas in the simulation. Uh, final question. Yeah. Ask Ro Roger to potentially just elaborate on this because I think it's it's not on the LA loop, but uh, based on where it is, where does the gas go, uh, and does some of it go to the LA loop? I was wondering if you could add. To yeah. That. So the the on our intro system, as Kitty mentioned, is on our high pressure system, which we would call our backbone transmission system. Unlike Aliso Canyon, which is in more of a localized transmission system in the LA Basin Loop. So gas from Honor Rancho feeds into that backbone system. That gas goes not only south, but also north to the San Joaquin Valley. 
and it feeds on the eastern part of our system and would have to work its way around to get back into the LA Basin. Uh, so even though as the crow flies it may be 10 miles, the distance it would have to travel from a gas standpoint will not make up for the responsiveness that Aliso Canyon brings to the LA Basin. Is it under some uh, maintenance right now or is it operational? Uh, currently today there is uh, dehydration equipment maintenance that we're performing today during the shoulder months as we mentioned. So that capacity will be available during the summer. And finally, I was trying to um, quantify uh, some of the action plan uh, reduction of natural gas and electric use for the consumers. Um, we're operating on a, you know, a tight margin here and it can make a difference. Is this a substantial difference that can be put into effect in the summer? Mm -hmm. Um, as far as quantifying uh, the megawatts of the therm savings. Um, the way DWP says they thought they could do 600 megawatts this summer in reductions from their testimony, if I wrote, heard that correctly. Uh, but. Yeah, I, let me clarify. I, I said 60 megawatts in demand 60. response, and we're okay. trying to up that. But uh, from LA's perspective is we could have curtailments in the neighborhood of 300 to 1,000 megawatts. So all the mitigations that we do will be insignificant to what might be necessary should the gas be curtailed. They're all helpful, they're all very important. It's building a future for tomorrow, because we have to continue that. But for this summer, they pale in comparison to the magnitude of the cuts in LADWP territory. Cal ISO will have a different number. I was just curious if Mr. Randolph had a total on paid um, yeah, on your analysis, I will. You um, I will provide to you and to the committee. Uh, I by like the, investing today, which could be helpful in the future. The future I mean, yeah. that's smart. I will. I mean, we are trying to do as as much no regret strategies as we can. Meeting, um, they have long term payoffs. Um, I was trying to pull together for this committee the total megawatts of all the measures we have out there. Um, it's unfortunately was on multiple spreadsheets. I will have something for you. Um, and for the committee by the end of this week on both um, estimated dollar spends and um, megawatt savings you can get from the conservation. Um, it's worth reiterating here to this group um, what Ms. Mr. Webster was saying, that even if we can maximize the load reduction in both the megawatts and the therms um, from these programs, um, there's still a very big risk out there. And I, I think where the biggest savings we will get is from public participation. Um, it is from things like FlexAlert. It is from uh, the, the public understanding that there is a real risk out there and there are things they can do, not dissimilar to how we got a lot of savings on the drought and not dissimilar to how we got a lot of savings um, um, after songs went down and during the energy crisis. So it's important for all of us to continue to message the need for folks to save the summer on those peak days. And that's where the most savings will come from. Could someone briefly comment? I know SoCal Gas, you relied on their modeling assumptions. Did the state regulators then review them all and found them consistent with everything that you would? How, how did that work? Yes. That's the short answer. Um, yeah, so we so said that's that. The, for the Energy Commission and right, the so PUC. Right, so the Energy Commission and the PUC and the ISO con, um, and DWP joined us as well. We met in a technical team with SoCal Gas. We walked through all of the assumptions. We watched the they did the They did the modeling assumptions. They, and you they developed, them. they ran the model. We worked together on developing the model assumptions. We agreed to the modeling assumptions. And then we looked at the, re reviewed the results to make sure that they comported with um, the assumptions, um, that the assumptions were executed the way that we thought that they would be, um, and that the results made sense. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Randolph, I want to ask you just simply, you're not going to be in the next panel, and I, I thought I'd ask you, uh, since uh, I'm hearing, you know, uh, in particular to SoCal Gas, I mean, they're, they're our operator, they're the state. Uh, without them, we really can't furnish gas to the people of Southern California and, and, and in, a, in a very large f footprint. So they're, they're essential to the system. And I know uh, that uh, there are a hefty amount of fines 
uh, lots of investment that they're putting in into prevent the, the leak any further, improving the system. In addition to the fines, I mean, we're looking at what is it right now, 600 million that's been paid by that company because of this one incident. And is there potential for bankruptcy? Is that, if that happens, what happens to the system? But other than that, I mean, just my question to you is uh, how much of this is going to be passed over to the ratepayers? 